for joining us today at Alzheimer Speaks Radio, where our focus since 2011 has been to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort around the world. And I hope that you'll subscribe today so that you can learn new techniques, tips, and resources from people all over the world and um, learn to live graciously alongside dementia. I'm your host, Lori LeBay. And my mom had dementia for 30 years. So I get the guilt, the isolation, the frustration, the exhaustion of caring for another. But I've also been able to find that path of joy, purpose, and passion. And so listen and let us help you find that too. Now, before I introduce our guest today, I want to first of all thank our listeners because without you guys, we are nothing. And you have taken basically our show around the world. So thank you for doing that through your likes, your clicks, and your shares on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram and who knows where else we are. I can't even track it anymore. But you have really built a sense of community around our show and Alzheimer Speaks as a whole. So I really want to thank you for your dedication and in helping lift of this uh this kind of blanket that uh, folds over us and let us peek out and gain some awareness of of again resources products and tools that we can use i just want to do a couple of announcements we are still having our airport travel survey out until september 15th and so if you are living with dementia or if you've been a travel partner for someone with dementia we would urge you to take that. It's, it'll take you probably about 40 minutes, um, but we really want to gather stories and data that can be used around the world for all airports. So um, please check that out. You can just go to alzheimerspeaks.com and you'll see it right up top on our front page. I also want to give a shout out to the Memory Cafe directory. For those of you that aren't familiar with Memory Cafes, they're a gathering of, of people with early to mid memory loss, as well as their care partners. And dementia brings everybody together, but it kind of plays a backseat. It's really about building a new peer group and community that you can feel comfortable with. It's, uh, it's very amazing. And then the game Stall Catchers is a fantastic opportunity where you can actually play a game, but you're actually analyzing real data for Alzheimer's disease. And you can just go to stallcatchers.com or again, visit our main website, alzheimerspeaks.com, where you can find out about all of our uh, things that I just mentioned previously. And you'll find out about other initiatives like the Purple Angel and becoming dementia friendly, or if you're looking for a keynote speaker or um, consultant on dementia. Now today, we are going to have a, a very interesting and I think fun conversation with our guest today. I've, I've known Beth Pop uh, for several years now, and she is just one of those true gems, um, very authentic, compassionate person. She is a nurse by training who serves seniors and caregivers, um, specifically those who care for others who have dementia in all, all its many forms. And she provides tools for caregivers to better understand what someone with dementia may experience and why they express what, they, what we call behaviors. And so she trains uh, people to use and, and really tap into needed tools and what she calls and works with is called compassionate touch. Beth is a certified master trainer and mentor for Educate and their products like Compassionate Touch and Dementia Live. So welcome. How are you doing today, Beth? 
I'm great, Lori. It's so fun to be on your show and talking with you today. Um, yes, I've known you for a couple of years and I would echo the response. You two are a gem. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I'm excited to have you on the show today. But before I get into our line of questioning, I always like to ask um, all my guests if they've been personally touched by dementia in terms of um, family or friends? You know, my experience with dementia goes back to my grandmother. Um, she was diagnosed with hardening of the arteries and senility. Um, you know, that was before we had better labels and greater understanding. I would guess if, if she were diagnosed, if she were alive today and living, she'd be diagnosed with vascular dementia. She was a lifetime smoker of Palmel's. Um, she had many um, TIAs, transients, ischemic attacks or many strokes. So the vascular dementia that I'm guessing my grandmother had is very different than the intermittent dementia I've seen with my own mother. My mother has had something that we in the field call reversible dementia. For her, it was dementia related to loss of hearing and needing hearing aids. And then she had another episode um, of weight loss and depression and, and dementia along with it, and it was related to a thyroid imbalance. So in both cases, we were able to correct the contributing cause to her dementia, and she was restored to full function or her baseline. Um, you know, like all of us who are aging, she has some things that she forgets, like I forget, um, but those are not dementia. Those are just uh, loss of memory related to aging. So um, two different experiences, one with a grandmother who I love to listen to her repeated stories, and she um, had very profound dementia, and then my mother's that was reversible. So those are my primary personal experiences. But then, of course, as a nurse, I've interacted with folks over the years with all kinds of dementias and all kinds of settings. Wonderful. Thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Educate? What the heck is Educate? Well, I love Educate. I love the play on the name. Um, I have an Educate uh, license plate, and people will often say to me, oh, are you a teacher? And I say, well, yes, but my role is to bring programs and understanding to caregivers in situations where they're caring with people who have dementia. Educate, um, their story began over 20 years ago when president and founder Pam Brandon was on a journey of caring for her own uh, father and mother. Her father had Alzheimer's, her mother's had Parkinson's. And that journey led her to her life's calling in helping caregivers deal with similar life challenges. I became acquainted with Educate at a conference in the Twin Cities, care providers uh, hosted an Educate booth, and I got to experience Dementia Live for myself. It was life-changing for me. I always enjoyed seniors. I especially had a heart for those with memory loss. Um, seemed to have a natural bent to be attracted to them. But when I went through Dementia Live, it changed everything. It gave me a deeper understanding and insight into what someone who has dementia might experience and feel like. I um, left that conference and called Pam and said, you know, who are you? What kind of training is this? I had never in my 38 years of being a nurse at that time experienced anything like this. It was tangible. It was experiential. It was impactful. Um, it changed what I thought about the way I interacted with families of those caring for people with dementia and walking alongside that journey. And so um, this became a relationship where I came on staff and uh, provide Dementia Live experiences and training primarily for, at this point, facilities and agencies and helping others be able to put the experience on. Um, and then um, likewise, Compassionate Touch, which is what we're gonna talk about today. But um, their flagship programs, all their programs um, are easy to learn and feasible solutions to create a culture change in facilities and communities, as like you, trying to make um, places dementia friendly. I work a lot now with churches, organizations. I'm part of the Dementia Friendly Coalition in Brown County, Wisconsin. Um, and we're always about trying to make our communities more dementia friendly. So 
that's kind of my story and what age Kate is. Can you, if you don't mind, before we get into the compassionate touch, can you tell people a little bit more about Dementia Live? Because some people might not be familiar with that because it is so powerful. Um, and it's, it's not, you know, you're, you're not sitting in a class getting lectured at all. So t can you kind of step them through what that looks like? Sure. Um, Dementia Live is an experience that uh, allows people to experience for a short time what it might be like to have dementia. We equip people with sensory equipment that alters their sense of touch. Um, the sense of touch in someone with dementia is greatly challenged. We all, you know, know what touch is. Children learn through touch. They learn through putting things in their mouth. Um, they, we all experience our environment with a sense of touch. But in dementia, the sense of touch is greatly confused and disturbed. And it isn't so much that you wouldn't touch something that's hot. It's the pathway, the nerve pathway in that part of the brain that doesn't remember or, or know that hot is hot or cold is cold or warm or soft, any of those. And so to put gloves on hands is our way of, of decreasing someone's ability to navigate their environment, what we're going to put them in, using their sense of touch. Also, um, normal aging reduces our fine motor control. We, the treads on our fingers start to wear down. That's normal aging. But the understanding of what we're feeling and experiencing through touch in our environment is skewed because of the brain damage. And Alzheimer's is, and dementia is, I shouldn't, I'm sorry, I did my own mistake. We don't call dementia Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is only one form of dementia. But anyone with dementia may have that disruption of touch understanding uh, because of the part of the brain that's impacted. We also put glasses on people. And what we're doing with the glasses is giving them a sense of reduced peripheral vision. Peripheral vision loss in persons with dementia is greatly accelerated. It's common with normal aging, but again, with dementia, it's greatly accelerated. And depending on what part of the brain is affected by the brain damage, um, the sense of being able to uh, see what's going on, interpret what's going on, but mostly uh, be aware that someone is next to you, behind you, coming toward you. And we wonder why people naturally startle or jump uh, in facilities. Um, our, our caregivers need, and our families need to be aware that people don't have peripheral vision. And so if you startle someone, any one of us, someone came up behind us and tapped us on the shoulder, we might startle. Um, so it's no surprise that persons with dementia react in a fight or flight kind of response and their reaction is to hit or swing. Um, caregivers need to be mindful of that to reduce the amount of combativeness. Um, it is really a big part. It, it, the responsibility is on the shoulder of the caregiver as much of, as the person who has dementia. And then the third way we alter the senses of a normal uh, attendee is we put headsets. There's no instruction in the headsets. What's meant to happen is we want to confuse the normal brain. And we're guilty as caregivers, as family members of narrating our lives or asking our loved ones to do three or four things, a complex command like button your shirt, get your purse, put on your lipstick, I'll meet you in the car. Um, that is too complex of an instruction to say to mom, mom, here's your sweater. Let's put it on. May I help you button it? Do you hear the difference? Uh, slowing down, being more specific. So the brain noise in the headsets is meant to confuse them as we give them tasks to do in the experience room with the hardship of gloves and glasses and headsets and give them a sense of what it might be to be overwhelmed by their environment and not be able to complete activities of daily living, things like writing your name on an envelope or putting, taking your pill or putting something together that seems to match. Um, we just remove that ability to do that and create a sense of frustration, overwhelmment, discouragement, despair. And then we can deal with those, we can discuss those feelings in an empowerment session afterwards and help caregivers understand new ways of communicating with their loved one trying new approaches for daily activities, um, reducing 
uh, confusion by offering colored plates instead of white plates with white rice or white mashed potatoes. Lots of different things that we talk about, home safety, um, color discrimination, uh, being safe and, and keeping them safe in environments. Lots of things that we talk about depends on the attendee, but the overwhelming purpose is again, to put them in a situation where they feel like they might have dementia for a short time to impact their understanding of it so they will be different as they care for those who have dementia. Thank you, I, that's really helpful I, and really a powerful, powerful experience to go through. I don't think I've ever talked to anybody who hasn't said, wow, I didn't know. So why don't you now tell us about compassionate touch and what exactly is compassionate touch through Educate? Well, as I mentioned a minute ago with Dementia Live, for example, the startle reflex or the overwhelmment with giving too many tasks at once. Um, I equate it to um, my child who was diabetic at age nine. And every time I seemed to come near him, it was for checking his blood sugar. So his natural response to that was, get away from me, mom, and, and he would run away. Well, fast forward many, many, many years, and now we have someone who is startled because you come from the side and they weren't anticipating your coming. Or every time you approach them, you're about to perform an intimate procedure, whether you're a professional caregiver or a family caregiver, maybe they've soiled themselves, or it's the day for their bath, or it's time to eat and eating is no longer pleasurable for them. But what they see in you is an enemy coming to perform on them instead of being with them. So compassionate touch um, was there's so much I can say about it. Uh, what Compassionate Dutch does is provide a pathway for communication, for empathy and understanding that meets the person with dementia where they're at and says, I just want to spend time with you. I'm here to connect with you, to comfort you and to calm you. I'm not here to perform a task or hurt you. Or, and, and so the message that we send with our hands has to be very pure and, and um, consistent and, and carefully uh, communicated. Compassionate touch is compassionate presence combined with skilled touch. So we are there to be present with the person and we do it through three different techniques, whatever is appropriate for that person. That's what makes it person-centered. Not everyone responds to the, all the different kinds of touch, nor does everyone respond to touch. And it also takes a mature caregiver to, to use it. But it's an essential piece that we're missing in our culture and needs to be used more regularly in a safe manner. You know, when you were talking about that, I, I was going to ask, you know, the, the next question of why is it needed? And you touched on that. Um, but, I, but I do agree. It is something that is so missing in our culture today. We have gotten so far away from, you know, just giving a person a hug or touching them in any way because we're afraid of lawsuits. Uh, it, it's just, a, it's a sad, sad situation where, a few people have abused touch, and now everyone has gotten scolded and is fearful that they're going to get reprimanded. If it's in a community, you know, facility-based setting, or even within their home. I mean, you look at, you know, the the Me Too movement and all of that. I mean, everything that that once was um, is changing. And don't get me wrong, I'm. I, I understand the whole Me Too movement and stuff, but I think sometimes we we over we over swing the pendulum sometimes when when situ, situations arise, and I think that touch is so important. I um, when I go out and speak and train, I I talk about you know the safest place for me to be. A, a lot of times when my when I was dealing with my own mom with dementia was just sitting with her next to her holding her hand in total silence, you know, and I think we forget about the simplicity of just being present and, and being totally with someone because we've got our, our phones ringing and we've got our schedules dinging at us. And, and it's just, we live in this, you know, really a fast paced, um, you know, and just fast, fast paced life. 
and we don't slow down to appreciate the little things like holding somebody's hands or polishing their nails or putting a little lotion on or, you know, that are just really simple, simple tasks, but really connect us to one another. Um, in, in, let's say, community settings, I'd like to have you break this apart in terms of why compassionate touch is needed in a community setting and then also in a family setting and how you shift gears from our societal setting right now. I want to go back to to what you said. You know, I as I've trained facilities um, of late in the last several months, what has been sad to me um, is that what what has encouraged me is that facilities want to change the culture. But what has been equally sad to me is when I go into facilities and they're only going to let me train a certain portion of their staff. In other words, if you are a dietary worker or if you are a housekeeper that you are restricted from any touch. And yet those are the people that are most, um, I've seen this even in my own mother-in-law who doesn't have dementia, who is new to assisted living. She's most in love with the dietary people and those who come into her apartment to clean or to repair something. And she's most fearful of those who should be providing the skilled care. And yet those are the ones that she needs to be in connection with so they can be doing even just visual checks, well-being checks, assessments, visually. Yes, there are um, very few things that she requires, but so many of our, our, older, um, our older population um, that are medically frail have feelings of isolation and anxiety and poor trust in caregivers. And so... To start with the facility-based focus, that's what we go in, is we like to go in and help them understand that touch deprivation is real, that people can feel lonely even in congregate living, that just because there's caregivers that are there doesn't mean that there's relationship. And um, the relationship primarily for them is based on service plans and what they need to get done. And they feel very stressed. They're oftentimes working short staff. Um, one of the greatest benefits we've found in training facilities that are willing to participate with compassionate touch education is that it reduces stress on both sides of the care partner equation. And so I know as a caregiver, as a nurse, I wasted time in my shift. We all do. We all do no matter what our job is. And so if you can transform that wasted time into relationship, into like you said, just sitting and holding someone's hand, perhaps putting some lotion on their hand, helping them with a, a foot rub at the end of the day as you know, a reward for wearing those compression hose, or just two minutes of a shoulder rub in the morning before needing to do that shower. Um, the relationship is enhanced. The calmness is evident in the resident. And with those residents who have dementia, who have expressive behavior throughout their shift, let's, let's, you know, the frequent one that is known is sundowning. So if you help a resident have a good lunch and then maybe they attend an activity and then you return them to their room and you spend a few minutes with compassionate touch, either the back rub or the hand massage, the foot technique, whichever one they respond to best and provide that technique, there is sort of a hangover effect. The hormones that are involved in compassionate touch, um, we all feel good when someone just sits with us. Well, if you sit with them for a few more minutes and provide a, a skilled technique of touch, they're going to relax and they're going to feel good. And that might carry them through their sundowning episode that typically occurs in an hour from now. And we bypass that anxiety, that fear, that um, normal response for them of feeling uncertain and not knowing what to do. They feel cared about. Oftentimes they'll rest. And what caregiver on day shift doesn't want a few minutes of peace at the end of their day to do that documenting. But our caregivers get so driven by those um, service plans and the need to document instead of just recognizing that these are people with stories and needs. The honest truth is expressive behaviors, whether it's isolating or wandering or uh, being combative, yelling, is really their inability to express a need. And so 
spending time with them, understanding how they tick is really another key piece of that compassionate touch. It, it gives caregivers an encouragement to look at them differently and, and to be willing to love them in spite of those behaviors. I often train caregivers and say, you know, we all have our favorite residents. Let's just, I mean, we're that way in life. We have best friends, right? And so um, I encourage them to practice compassionate touch on those that they love being with, but to recognize that those are who are hard to be with are the ones that need it the most. And those are the ones that we're seeing the greatest response with, a reduction in antipsychotics and anti-anxiety medications we're seeing, um, which is keeping with the CMS mandate to get rid of drugs. So I love putting this non-pharmacological tool in the hands of professional caregivers. Well, it makes so much sense. I, I think um, I think families sometimes think, well, you know, it'll, it'll all happen. It'll just kind of blow out. But it, it, jobs are so structured and they're so defined and they're so task oriented that sometimes people can give a hug, but it's not an authentic hug. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing worse than getting an unauthentic hug. I mean, that just makes you feel it's like, oh, I wish it wouldn't have touched me at all because that just felt icky. And so people with dementia can still pick up on all the nonverbals that I think is so important that people don't, don't understand. I remember um, seeing uh, Richard Taylor, <clears throat> and for those of you that aren't familiar with Richard, Richard uh, lived with dementia, was one of the first real international voices that we heard, and he was from the States, and um, we had him speak when we did our, our kickoff here for our memory cafe, and he did an he told a story about how he could tell when he told his friends that he had dementia, he could tell by how they hugged him if he was ever going to see him again or not. Touch is incredibly powerful and it's, I think it's underutilized and the value is not appreciated on what it, what it gives us. And as we age, you know, we typically, most people become less physical than what they used to be. And that's a huge loss, but it's one of those invisible losses that nobody really talks about. And so it's really important to make sure that we're filling those gaps. And, you know, when we're filling those gaps, we're, we're filling souls. And, and that happens, like you said, on both sides, not just to the, the person who we're giving a hug or holding their hand, but it goes both ways. And it, and you, like you said, it calms us down. It just, it brings you to that level of, um, a level of intimacy that just makes both sides feel safe. You know, when it's, when it's an authentic, um, caring touch. And, and again, you don't, you don't want to touch somebody who doesn't like to be touched, or maybe they're not ready to be touched because they don't trust you enough. You know, I would imagine there's a, a sense in, in being able to build that up as well, too. Is that true? You know, you, you hit on so many incredible things. I think one way to easily break it down is to remind people that in in these care settings, um, we have two kinds of touch. Um, there's, and it's true at home too. Um, like with my diabetic child, there's instrumental cut touch, which is necessary to perform a task or pr procedure. And then there's that expressive touch that you were talking about, offered spontaneously. It shows, you know, that care and concern. It provides reassurance or um, it has the power to affect the feelings of others. And the sad thing is, is that I have to really stress when I do this training in facilities is don't turn compassionate touch into, into an instrumental procedure. Don't turn it in to one of those things that you're going to do in the service plan. Yes, it has to be on the service plan because unfortunately in our day and age, we have to document everything we do. But remember to center yourself and bring yourself into that situation to really embrace the person and show that expressive care. You know, back in the 50s, there was a, I, I've thought of this a lot and brought it up at a couple of trainings. Back in the 50s, there was a psychologist, Harry Harlow, and he began a series of experiments on baby monkeys and he deprived them of their biological mothers. Um, and, and they had, they 
uh, learned very quickly that these monkeys had failure to thrive. Now we would never do this kind of an experiment on our seniors or those with dementia, but the truth is, is that medically frail elders fail to thrive and they need touch at the end of life. Even those who are in palliative care, we may not do the specific techniques of the hand technique or the back neck technique or the foot technique, but persons who are at end of life, whether it's from dementia or some other condition, also benefit from touch. And no one should die alone. You know, the first sense that we experience outside of the womb is touch. We, none of us were dropped in a lily pad. You know, we were either caught or we were pulled out. And we come into this world with touch and we ought to leave this world with touch. And to die alone is a sad, is a sad commentary. Um, I remember as a nurse early on working in hospice, I was afraid to turn my person, my people who were dying, actively dying. I was afraid that, you know, I'd be responsible for their last breath just by turning them. And that's just an honest caregiver telling you. Um, but if I was with them and holding them, wouldn't that be better than for them to have passed alone than me being safe out in the hallway? And so um, we even try and encourage our hospice workers to train families, the same with our Alzheimer's um, caregivers, and you know, kind of brings that segue back to how to use compassionate touch at home. Um, yes, there is some normal decrease in intimacy or touching as people age, but that doesn't mean that our need for touch goes away. Um, we've seen medically frail elders respond well to touch and we ought to continue to do it. And so I just love this part of our program, being able to get out there and talk to families, talk to parish nurses, talk to Stephen ministers, talk to hospice workers, mm -hmm. volunteers. I mean, it's a life skill we've lost. Um, and, and we talked about that, you know, why? Because unfortunately, touch in our culture has gotten a bad rap, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't have gone that way. It's real and it's effective in every aspect of life. It reminds me of a story. My, my daughter is in memory care as an activities person. And so she sees, you know, sadly, a lot of people progress. And one of her, her uh, clients or residents ended up in the, in the um, hospital, in hospice. She knew she wasn't going to come back. So she went down to the hospital to, to see her. And she walked into a room with family just all sitting there, nobody sitting by the by the love their loved one. And they were all grieving. And and Danielle came in and said, you know, I hope it's okay. I just wanted to, you know, give my respects and talk to her one last time. And and they said, Well, you know, she's not gonna respond. There's nothing you can do. And Danielle said, Would you mind if I just if I just said my piece, you know? So she did, she went up and she held the woman's hand and I'm going to cry and told her how important she was to her. And, and the woman's eyes popped open and she said a few words and had this beautiful smile on her face. And that family missed that moment, that opportunity. What a gift. But, what, but no, the family was in the room. Danielle, right. Danielle let them all stay in the room. But she said they were so shocked because they you know, they heard the nurse say, there's no hope, instead of, you know, she might not be able to respond, but she can, she can still take in, I, I mean, I always like to tell people that, you know, um, dementia sometimes can almost be like a coma, where, yeah. you, you know, you're, you're saying stuff, you're not getting a response, but yet we've all been taught to accept that they can take it in. And we need yes. to do that with a person with dementia. We have to have the belief. And she said the family just scrambled to the bedside, kind of pushing one another because they wanted to have that next connection. And, and had she not come, they would have missed out on that gift. Yeah. And that was a huge gift she gave them. Yeah. And it's just, uh, but I think part of it is, as humans, we have to believe that we're always connected, you know, that there's always a possibility and it's not, we're not always saying things or doing things to fill us. It's to, it's really to fill the other person, you know, and, and I, you know, I had it happen with, with my aunt who was in a coma 
and they said, you know, the hospice uh, person was just beautiful. And she said, you know, chances are she's not going to open her eyes. She's not going to talk. She's not going to squeeze your hand. Um, but you just tell her whatever you need and know that she's taking it in. And I was so appreciative of that. And so I went in and I talked, with, you know, with my aunt and I was holding her hand. And then I had told her about this dream I had where her husband came to tell me to tell her that it's time. And I, you know, I described my uncle waiting for her and she squeezed my hand, her eyes popped open and she looked at the ceiling with this bright, beautiful smile and the room got chilly and it, it only lasted maybe five seconds and her eyes closed and she squeezed, she squeezed my hand, but her smile remained. And she heard everything. She felt everything just through through our touch, you know, and it was just, it was a, a blessing to be able to, like you said, be there and help her, help her transition. And, you know, what an honor. And I know so many people are so scared of that, but it's really one of the most beautiful things in the world that you can, you can be part of. And it doesn't have to be just about somebody passing. I, I remember with my mom, we used to dance. And then I used to dance with her in the wheelchair because, you know, she was in the wheelchair and then we used to arm dance and then we used to wrist dance. And then we got down to just a pinky dance, just a pinky dance. I love it. <laughs> but it was, it, but it was still that touch and it, we're always able to adapt and, and it brought her joy and it brought me joy because it just, it still said we're connected, you know, even if, so many other things have changed. There's at our core, there is something that cannot be taken away. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Our, our sense of touch does not go away. It's one of the last ones to experience and it's an important piece to add to our relationships. And, you know, again, even, even husband, wife, for those caregivers who are out there caring for their loved one, um, the loss of intimacy is, is inevitable but the this presence that can be expressed through touch doesn't have to be lost. Yeah, I had uh, one client who said, and I loved this, they started out every day and ended every day with a dance. Mm -hmm. And it was just their way to be intimate, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was like, what a beautiful, beautiful route. And they said, sometimes we had music playing and sometimes we just made our own music, but it was that touch. It brought them together. It gave them a calmness and, um, you know, just centered them. And what, what a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, I, I want to ask you a little bit, um, you know, we've, we've kind of touched in and out here on, on families, but is there any Anything specifically you'd like to say to families about compassionate touch? I think for families, um, keep trying. Uh, I would say incorporate touch beyond the skilled care that you're needing to do. Um, I think we've talked about that a lot. Um, just holding a hand, a hand on a knee, a hand on a shoulder, Eye contact. Eye contact is huge. It's very intimate. When I do these exercises with strangers, it's very difficult for strangers to look one another in the eye. If you can connect with someone through their eyes, you're connecting with a piece of them that very few people will ever do. And just making that eye contact a priority, apart from giving a shower, getting dressed, having a meal, you know, dancing, you mentioned it, you know, the beginning and ending of the day with a dance, there's connection there. I think that connection is more important than, and I don't want to diminish the need for physical care and, and those, you know, things that you need to do, but to elevate the importance of touch in the relationship, safe touch, gentle touch, connecting touch, the purpose of the, the purpose being to connect, to comfort, and to calm. And I think if families just remember that, um, th that will change for them. If they can just remember that the purpose of touch is to connect, to comfort, and to calm, and to look for those things to happen as a response to touch, 
um, will benefit them. I like that connect, comfort, and calm. It it um, it reminds me of of my memory chip where I focus on safe, happy, and pain free. Mm. You know, just three really simple things that we can do easily. It doesn't have to cost a thing. Mm-hmm. And and we all anybody at any age can can be part of it, mm-hmm. and yet we we don't slow down enough to just think of connect comfort and calm and it's huge it's and it's about their connection their comfort their calm and when we learn to um, help them with that it makes our world more connected more calm. And more comfortable. And just two minutes before a, a shower, just five minutes before going to bed, just a minute here or there will change everything. Yeah, it really is very, um, very important and very subtle um, changes. And I think that's one of the reasons it's, it's, you know, passed over, or missed is because people are just going, they're going too fast. Yep. You know, they're just going too fast. And, you know, when you talk about touch, um, I'll just throw in another uh, story here with my mom in the shower. You know, she's loved taking a shower and then all of a sudden um, the shower actually hurt her body. You know, it was coming down too strong and um, was very uncomfortable, very painful for her. And by changing a shower head out to a rain shower head, you know, it made that more comfortable. It made her more connected and um, cooperative in the shower and gave her that calmness. And, you know, it's just little things, but, um, you know, or when somebody is cold, I mean, just warming somebody's hands, you know, or feet when they're cold, or maybe it's their neck. Um, All those little things make a huge, huge difference. Um, Plus, it says you're important to me. You know, we so underestimate the largest, I would say most important organ in our body, and that's our skin. It's the largest organ, and we don't take care of it the way we should. And in this situation, it just underscores the importance of giving attention to it. And again, like you said, that, and even our conversation has slowed toward the end of our interview because we're talking about touch and we're being reminded that we need to slow down. And that is, in our culture, a very foreign thing. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. And I love how it can help reduce those, which I don't even like using the word behaviors. I like to call it, you know, a reaction or a signal. Um, but when we, when we focus on what's the cause, and like you said earlier, it's, there's some point of discomfort with somebody somewhere there, and what a better way to, um, to calm a situation down by just not making them feel alone. It's honestly the expression of an unmet need, and we may not know what the need is, But our being willing to be present and to accept them where they're at may stay it off. But again, being being mindful that it's an unmet need and that we need to dig deeper and to look behind what the behavior is to what's causing it. Do you want to summarize for us some of the benefits of um, compassionate touch? Sure, I can do that. Yeah, there are several benefits to compassionate touch. Uh, When you use the back technique, uh, it can aid sleep because it's so soothing and relaxing. And in general, it just decreases restlessness and agitation. Same with the foot technique. Again, deeply relaxing. I don't know about you, but if you ever had a foot rub at bedtime, um, often promotes sleep. And so if we can use that at bedtime instead of that sleeping pill, or how about those re- those residents or family members that get up in the middle of the night to uh, go to the bathroom or are confused because they think nighttime is over, it easily helps you put them back to sleep without the aid of a, a medicated um, response. Also, um, you know, with the hand protocol, just it's calming. Um, who doesn't like to have lotion applied to their hand? And it, it's not body work. It's not uh, getting deep tissue to relax or anything like that. It's, it's, a, it's really psychological and emotional. And again, um, the benefits are on both sides of the care partner equa- equation. 
It benefits the receiver and the provider of the technique. And we just love to see what's happening between um, the residents and their caregivers professionally and in their families as well. Lots of benefits. Again, reducing pain, reducing stress um, for both parties. It, it's a beautiful thing. Well, and it's a neat thing to be able to pass on to um, children and stuff too. I know my my four and a half year old granddaughter, she uh, she comes up, I bet twice a week she'll come around me and say, Grandma, can I do your feet? She loves lotioning my feet and my legs. I'm like, have at it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's just a, it's it's just such a simple little thing, but she she takes great joy and pride in that, and I know it calms her down, and she feels like she's caring for me, and you know, and I just soak it all up, you know, big time. Um, or I had um, I had brought uh, another one of my grandchildren to a therapist, and it's play therapy that they do. And she said, I want to, uh, I want to, I want to do Steve's nails because she's big into nails. So Steve's really good, the therapist. And he's like, okay. And he was, he said, he was just so shocked. He never realized how intimate getting your nails painted was, you know, yeah. but it's, that <laughs> the pants, it's that touch. And so he said, I, I, I've got to incorporate this, you know, into more things or I said yeah I used to massage my mom's hands and it's just a very simple non-threatening um you know and it doesn't have to none of this has to have a big to do with it no, no. it's just about being in the moment with somebody else yeah and, um I I love well I love all that you guys do at educate and I um I, I love the dementia live and the compassionate touch. I, I can't say enough good things about it. Do you want to um, tell us um, contact information you'd like people to have? You know, people can find us on the internet. They can Google Ageucate, A G E U K T. Um, and find information there. We have trainers throughout the States. We also have um, a presence in Canada and Australia. Um, there's a question or contact box on the website for professional providers, professional caregivers. Uh, we have both on-site and online training. For families, we depend on <clears throat> our network of master trainers and our our very large network work of authorized providers, when we train facilities, we encourage them to not only train their staff and their resident families, but to provide community outreach. So um, anyone can go on our website and find an authorized provider in their state. And if they want more information, ask if they would provide a community outreach event on Compassionate Touch. Um, again, our client engagement person is Mary Peterson, and um, her email is mary.peterson at educate.com. Again, that's uh, provided on the website. Love to talk with anybody. I'm primarily in Wisconsin, knew you from my time in Minnesota. Um, happy to travel. Uh, we are doing grant training in North Carolina, Ohio, um, Minnesota, we'll be up there. We just, Tennessee just came on. We have five other states looking at us. We just can't get enough of this information out there and help families and professional caregivers be able to change the culture of care, to be more empathetic, more understanding, and to help, in this case, to comfort, to calm, and to be present with those who have dementia. Wonderful. And if you are a phone person and don't like using the, the internet or email, um, Mary Peterson's phone number is 817-857-1157, extension 204. That's 817-857-1157, extension 204. And again, you can always go to their website, Educate, and that's A G E. U C A T E dot com. Thank you so much, Beth, for taking time with us today. Any any last minute things that we didn't uh, didn't mention that you'd like to like to share? 
you know, I hate to quote Ellen, but I think I, do, I, I will. I'll just say, be kind, you know, offer a compassionate presence, use eye contact, let the message of your hands be pure. Um, we have too much bad touch in our culture and we need to get back to what um, compassionate presence is. Um, more than a handshake and doing what we know is right. Thanks for having me today. <laughs> Well, thanks for thanks for being with me. It was just great information, and I think something that so many need. And to me, it it aligns with with my work beautifully because I, you know, I'm all about shifting our care culture from crisis to comfort. And you guys are just so solidly right in with that message. So, thank you again. And. Again, for our listeners, you can learn more about Educate by going to their site. Um, again, that's ageucate.com. And if you want to find out more information about Alzheimer Speaks, just go to alzheimerspeaks.com. There you will get information on all of our initiatives and projects that we're working on. Or if you're looking for um, you know, speaker, um, trainer, or consultant, I'd be glad to talk with you. Or, or maybe you're one of our listeners and you're ready to be on air and share your story. I would love to talk with you. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Hi, this is Suzanne Newman, host of the Answers for Elders podcast and radio show. We are the North Star that guides you through the complicated journey of senior care with trusted experts in money, law, living solutions, and more. So join us on this station, your favorite podcast channel, or just go to AnswersForElders.com. Meet the Way Showers who will help your journey go a lot easier.